There we go. Blue light. Okay. Uh, hello. My name is Don Jones. Welcome to Stupid DSC Tricks. So uh, this is not kind of a standard session that you may have already gotten used to in your short time here at Summit. Uh, we're not going to look at a lot of code, and we're, we're not going to do a lot of demo, and we're also not going to do a lot of slides. We're hopefully going to do a lot of talking and discussing. As, as I, I've been working with DSC for well, a couple years, it's been out now, right? V4. Uh, you spend a lot of time talking to different people who, who kind of have the, the base idea of what DSC is supposed to do, like from a business perspective. Right? For example, one of the things you can tell people is, look, DSC is, at the end of the day, very similar to group policy. Right? You're going to have this, this policy-based thing that tells your computers how to, what to be, and you're going to ship it out through some magical method, and the computer will just do that stuff. So, I mean, super, super high level, very similar. And so they start digging into it. Well, could I do this? Could I do this? Well, no. I mean, not really how it's designed. You've got to, got to rethink your philosophy. So over the past month or so, um, Murawski, uh, Dave Wyatt, and I have, have kind of been having this informal, you know, bounce back and forth exchange about some of the ways we could get DSC to do stuff that maybe it, it wasn't specifically designed to do. Not that it's bad, but kind of hacking it. Like, where, where could we really just, like, you know, jam your fist in its mouth and make it do what you, what you wanted it to do, whether it wanted it to or not? And uh, that kind of spilled out. We have a private Slack channel for the folks that come to my, my DSC DevOps camp. Uh, it's about 20 folks who, who were there last year. And so we, and these, these are folks who, are, who have their, their brains connected to PowerShell 24 seven, and they're doing DSC, and they're doing DevOps, and they're running into the problems, and they're, they're trying to get creative about solving the problems and everything else. Um, and so we start going back. We start kind of coming up with ideas of ways we can do different stuff that, that you know, when you look at the DSC PowerPoint slide, you're like, no, it could never do that, but, but maybe it could. So I thought this would kind of be a nice place, because I know a lot of you, how many of you are using PowerShell? Oh, that's reassuring. Good. That did not happen the last time I did this. <laughs> uh, and how many of you are using DSC? Even just fussing with it in the pilot? Or, okay, good. So I thought this would be a good crowd to bounce some ideas off of, and maybe have folks say, well, what about how could you do this? And see if we can come up with some approaches. Right? So that's kind of what we're, what we're doing. Oh, by the way, you guys have seen this slide before, right? Quick round of applause for all the folks who are... Um, really proud of, of, of the fact that, I, I don't know if you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit rare in a lot of product teams uh, at Microsoft for people to stick around for a decade, right? It's an easy company to move around, and you know, you, you want to move on to something exciting and new. So it's pretty cool that there's so many people who've, who've been around that long. So this is really meant to be kind of a brainstorming session, a think outside the box session. Let's, let's talk about some things that we'd love for DSC to be able to do for us as, as a business, right? Forget the technology. Anything should be possible if we have enough money. So let's just think about what we want it to do and then get a little bit outside the envelope and think about how we could force it to do it. So I'll, I'll kind of kick things off with an example, which is um, this one, dynamic printer mapping. Now, you got to talk, talk to talk yourself through how DSC works, right? You sit on your computer, you, the author, you sit on your computer, and you type out a PowerShell script, a configuration script, right? And that can have lots of logic in it. You can, have, you can have if blocks and loops and all kinds of crazy stuff in there, yeah? And you push run, and what's it produce? Moth. One or more moths, right? Management object format, moth file. A moth file is just a text file. It's not code. Now you can have little snippets in there if you do a certain type of resource called a script resource, but generally speaking, a moth is static. This moth is what I want that computer to look like. And I created that description completely out of context. I didn't run it on that computer. Uh, I, I'm running it at a totally different place and time. I'm just giving it to that computer. And that computer then runs that, but the computer doesn't think about it. Right? The moth says, you need to be a domain controller. You need this IP address. You need to be running you know, these services. You need these files copied over. Don't ask questions. Don't make decisions. Don't think about it. I'm not interested in your opinion. Just do it. Now, what we tell people is, in a server workload, that's kind of OK. right? Because servers, we tend to set them up. We want them one way, and then we try really hard to make them never change. right? That's why we have ITIL, right? Stop all change. That's what that means. <laughs> and. But it doesn't apply so well to client scenarios, because clients are, client computers, well, 
Who uses a client computer? Users, right? And they're squishy. They're people. They move around, they get up, they change jobs, they install elf bowling, they uninstall this. They, you know, it, it, there, there's changes. Well, one of the neat things about group policy is you don't actually set up all the policy decisions up front. Some of the decisions get made by the client as it downloads it, right? What organizational unit are you in? What domain are you in? What site are you in? Uh, what user groups are you in? What WMI filter type things are going on? So it can be very, very kind of dynamic and customized. And the group policy you get today might be slightly different from the one you get tomorrow. Well, that's not what DSC really does. DSC just says, be this, always. Now, obviously, there are certain clients, computer scenarios, you know, you think kiosks or uh, if you work at a bank and you've got those floors full of, of phone slaves, you want all those computers to be exactly the same all the time, sure. But most users are, are squishier than that. And so one example is dynamic printer mapping. Now, if, if I'm writing a DSC configuration script, I can certainly have a printer resource that says install such and such a printer, right? No problem. But if I tell you to install the printer for, for building A, and you run over to building B for a week, how, how, do, I, how do I get you a, a printer over there, right? It, it's not, there's no evaluation. The LCM, the local configuration manager that's reading that MOF, doesn't have the ability to say, all right, we're getting to printer mapping now. So it says map him to printer A, but gosh, you know, I just know he's not over in that building right now, so I'm gonna pick a different printer. It, it doesn't do that. There's no logic in the LCM. It, it's just following a set of instructions and calling a bunch of resources. So this is one of the first problems we started down because it's one of the first things that comes up in a discussion when you're trying to explain to someone why DSC and group policy are different. And we thought, you know, we could totally do this with DSC. Completely. How? All we have to do is write a resource that dynamically maps printers based on some criteria. So in your configuration script, you say, you know, whatever the resource name is, um, map a printer, yes. Map nearest printer, yes. And that's all that goes into your MOF. Your MOF just knows that it's supposed to map a printer. That's it. The MOF doesn't know where the printer is, doesn't know where it should map it to, doesn't care about any of that. So when you compile that MOF, you, you, you create that text file, you slam it out to all your nodes, it runs a DSC resource, which is just PowerShell code, or, or can be, right? And that PowerShell code goes, oh, okay, I'm supposed to map a printer. Great. What's my IP address right now? Let me go see what Active Directory site I'm in. I can figure that out locally. I can actually go see a list of published printers in Active Directory and find one that's near me, and I'm going to go ahead and map that. So the dynamicism in that case lives on the client computer. It's not in the LCM. The LCM is still relatively dumb, but the LCM is calling on a smarter friend who can make that runtime decision. And we started thinking about some of the ramifications of that, right? Because you have that idea, and, and then you, you know, you put your third drink down, and you start to think, is this a good idea? Um, and after three drinks, obviously, it's a great idea. So the next morning, we thought, all right, so what are some of the ramifications of this? Well, all right, how, how often does the LCM run a consistency check by default? 15 minutes. Is it going to be bad for that thing to be constantly trying to remap a printer? Well... If you, have it, if you have it go look at what printer it should map, and then just check to see if that one's already mapped, and if it is, well, don't do anything, which is how resources are supposed to be written, right? Don't do anything until you test first, right? Run test. Only run set if you have to. Well, maybe that wouldn't be too bad. And we actually, how many of you work for healthcare? Yep, there's always a couple. Um, we actually thought, you know what? This would actually solve a couple of really cool scenarios because you get into a hospital situation and the doctor runs from room to room to room and he's logging on different profiles, but he wants his profile to be mapped to the printer that's in that room right then, so he's not printing out someone's personal information six rooms down, right? So we thought, you know, actually this whole really frequent dynamic remapping thing in certain scenarios could be kind of cool. Um, so, but we stopped thinking about that because healthcare freaks us all out because blood, of course. So what, what do you think? Comments. Have anybody ever thought of, of going after it that way? Unmapping the map for a while. Ah, do I, when, and when do I unmap it? Yeah, yeah, we thought about that too. 
Um, partially, we, we weren't sure if we cared or not. Because I, I guess what it was is in the, we, we figured if the test runs and you're mapped to the one you should be, don't do anything. But if you're not, then just go unmap whatever was there and then map whatever you should be right then. It kind of depends on the business situation, right? You, you know, if you've got some HR person who's got a local printer you don't want to unmap, you'd have to have some way of accounting for that, yeah. Yeah, we kind of we kind of walked through that a little bit. What else? What if you're not on the network? What if you're not on the network? Well, then you're not going to be printing, so it's not a problem. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it might. I mean, that, that again all gets down to your test, right? Or, or, or your set. We had a little bit of argument about where we put this. I think we eventually decided maybe both. Uh, but your set should certainly say, look, are we even on a network here? I mean, maybe we don't have the right printer, but is, is it even possible? And if not, then forget it. That's more, that's more doing exactly the right thing is what you're doing. You're now, what are the failure scenarios I might run into? And let's, let's account for those so we're not just spewing errors into the log. But yeah, yeah, you do have to walk through that. What else? In that case, it's a valid test. I mean, I'm not on the network. I have no printer, and the approach test is okay. Yeah, and, and, and that was actually my argument, is in the test, first check to see if I can even possibly get to a valid state, and if I'm not, just say true, so we don't even run set. So one challenge about that, you're going to have is uh, on large floors where you have a single subnet for that floor, for example, but let's say there's 10 printers, not large floor, floor. How do you determine the locality to those printers? Yeah, so how do you determine the locality to a printer? That's what gets your problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and I say that with all love. <laughs> but the, the fact is we're all going to have a different set of business rules for how we do that. And what we're talking about here is you're going to have to build a certain amount of infrastructure, potentially, to let you do that. Some people might have databases. Some people might have something they put into Active Directory. I got plenty of customers who don't have all their client computers in Active Directory, so they're going to have to have some other place to look it up. Uh, you know, maybe there's a SQL Server. Maybe you've got some, some back-end tool or something. So, yeah, you're going to have to do all that. Right, those are, are things. I don't call them challenges. They're just they're they're part of what you would have to solve as part of it. What if say your nearest printer is down out of paper? Now, see, but, so, let me pause you real quick. Before we go down the rabbit hole of making this a printer mapping session, <laughs> I want to point out that what you guys are thinking about are the right questions. We're not trying to solve the printer mapping module here today. What we're trying to do is make DSC do stuff that it is initially not designed to do. All of those questions are answerable. We could code an answer to all of those. It might mean having to have a directory of printers and who's allowed to use one or whatever, which actually gives you more control and flexibility than you probably have today. We can do those things. But the point is, getting DSC to a point where it can let us do those things. So yeah, we do have to have all those things. So what else was going to get to? Is there like an alternative configuration or a second configuration? There's no alternative configuration. In fact, let's talk about that. ESPN, you and me, we had it yesterday too. So here's how the LCM works at a really high level. When it gets a MOF, right? So we, we're pushing a MOF to the LCM, right? Either we're pushing it or the LCM has been programmed to pull it from a pull server, right? Those are the the only two ways you can get them off there, right? No, that's a trick question. Trick question, there's three ways to get them off to the LCM. What's the first way? Give me one. Push, push, what's the other one? Second, pull. The third is injection. The third is called file copy. It's very advanced. <laughs> Haven't really had that technique for more than five or six decades. And if you're going to inject, here's what you need to know. In the folder where the configurations live, you've got pending.moff. It's a text file. Pending.moff is the one that you just got most recently and haven't done anything with, potentially. Current.moff means you are currently running a consistency check, and that's the moff you're using. This is a really cool thing. Look, they're two separate files. Why are they two separate files? Because if the LCM has one of them open, you can't write a new one to it, right? You guys have run into this before with every file type ever on a file server, right? So it's not like this is, is word collaboration. So when it starts to run a consistency check, it makes a file copy of pending.moth 
names it current.mof so it can have one exclusive to itself without having an exclusive log on pending.mof. So while a consistency check is running, you can overwrite pending.mof. You can also do it when there isn't a consistency check running. You can any any time you can do it. We've also got previous.mof, and that's the one I ran last time. That's kind of a last known good type of recovery situation. This is why if you're in DSC5 and you're really, really messing around with it, like how many of you like to just kick the LCM and make it run right now and not wait 15 minutes, right? You know what? You're going to live for at least 20, 30 more years. Let it take its time, right? You're not going to die that soon. But that's why if you screw up a config and you get the LCM into kind of a uh, state, you can use remove DSC configuration. There's a command to remove the previous, and you have switches. Which one do you want to remove? Previous, current, pending, right? So you can remove all of them if you want to. Uh, and that's why it's important to do that if you need to kind of get it out of its own head. But so we've got these ones we can mess with. And so this takes us to a really, really kind of important capability. We could, for example, tell me if you think this is crazy. Let's say I write a custom resource, and we're going to call it crazy resource. I ship that out to all my machines. Yes? I write a configuration script, and all it does, the only thing in my configuration script is run crazy resource. Crazy resource. Parameter, yes. That's it. Okay? I run that configuration script. What gets produced? I'm off. What's in the off? Just one thing, right? It's a text file, and it says run crazy resource. I push that out to my computer. It goes into pending.moff, right? LCM, sometime later. Ah, time to run a consistency check. 15 minutes has expired. I'm going to copy pending.moff to current.moff. I'm going to open it up. At this point, is there anything stopping me from doing something to pending.moff? Nope. So it runs crazy resource. Crazy resource dynamically generates a whole brand new moff and sticks it in pending.moff. Who said, oh? <laughs> I didn't say these were smart DSC tricks. <laughs> Look at the title of the session. <laughs> and at the very end of that dynamically produced pending.moff, it recalls itself. So the last thing in there, depending on everything else, is call crazy resource again. And so it runs that. That'll take you know a minute to whatever it takes. LCM waits 13, 14, 15 minutes. OK, pending.moff, copying it over to current.moff, and wow, look at all this stuff that's in here. And all those decisions were just made 15 minutes ago, and they were made locally on that machine. You could obviously do a hybrid approach, right? That's kind of an extreme example to lay it out. You could certainly ship out a moff that had a lot of your base configuration stuff, and then called crazy resource to just dynamically add in printer mappings or whatever dynamic, more local intelligence things. You could evaluate the WMI repository. You can make decisions. You've got the full PowerShell scripting language at your disposal to create a new MOF that will run the next time. Crazy resource could say, OK, look, here's the base MOF. I'm going to copy that off here to make my own little copy. And I'll always use that as my starting point, and I'll add dynamic stuff to it as I go. <coughs> that's crazy. That's called a crazy resource. What do you think? Now, downsides. Um, one, I'm not actually sure if you can do this in version 5 right now. Because, you know, v5 introduced this new uh, encryption. So the moth files actually sit on the drive encrypted. Um, and I'm not sure if it would be feasible for your local crazy resource to get that same certificate and encrypt them. It should be. I just haven't really dove into that. Um, it should be possible because they're not encrypted on the pull server, right? They come across the pull server in clear text. Now they do that across an HTTPS channel because none of us are dumb enough to run an HTTP pull server, right? Right. 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 So they come across clear text through an SSL channel. The LCM is what's encrypting them to begin with. Therefore, that certificate has to be somewhere on the machine we can get to it. Therefore, crazy resource should be able to, A, decrypt it, because the LCM has to be able to decrypt it. 
But crazy resource should definitely be able to create a dynamic moth, encrypt it, and then stick it in a pending moth. And then the LCM will copy it to current and then read it. Make sense? Seem plausible? Yeah. Are there any tools or? Are there any tools? Wow. Making moths. Wow. Are there any tools for making moths? Yeah, configuration scripts. That's not a flip answer, right? Because if crazy resource is a configuration script, then PowerShell knows how to run configuration scripts and make moths. Or if crazy resource has, has the ability to dot source a configuration script to run it, it will produce a moth, right? Dot source this file, run it, bleh, moth occurs. Right now, that's the only reliable tool we have for making a moth. Another downside is troubleshooting. It's going to suck. It's complicated. It's going to suck. It's going to be complicated. There's, gonna, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces, and, and here's the downside. Anytime you've got logic running at the furthest point from you, it's harder. So if you were to do this, you'd really, really have to be disciplined about logging. Really disciplined about logging. Ideally into the event log because you can get to that remotely fairly easily. Worst case, you know, dumping stuff into a file that's in a well-known location so you can get to it. You're going to have to log the snot out of stuff. How many of you are used to producing like nuts verbose logs in your scripts? Yeah, the rest of you need to get to a point where you can raise your hands on that question. Because <laughs> um, it's going to need a lot of logging to, to do this. Now, if you modularize that, you know, if crazy resource is doing five different things, mapping a printer, doing, you know, whatever crazy stuff it's doing, if you modularize that really well, it should be easy to test those, those functions in standalone in a variety of situations, run them through pester tests, make sure they work before you deploy them. Test your code. Says. Okay. Um, a couple of folks look surprised when I said that, so I just want to make sure. Um, logging is going to be really, really important. The application of that MOF, right? So we, we created the dynamic MOF. Now the LCM is going to run. Ideally, you want your resources, whatever resources are being called by that dynamic MOF, you know, whether it's the, a, a Microsoft resource or when you've written your own, you want it to be spewing a lot of log data too, like to the debug log or something like that to the point where if you're using one of the Microsoft ones and you don't feel it logs enough, you need to walk your butt up to GitHub, fork the project, add a ton of logging, and then do a request for them to pull it back in. Wow, you have two lines of logging for every line of code. Yep, that's okay. That's just what I feel we need. So I, I mean a lot of logging is gonna have to be necessary here. You guys don't look scared enough. <laughs> What are, some, what are some use cases, some things that you wish you could do with DSC? Before, because I have another tangent I want to go down, but before we do that, what are some things that you think you want to do with DSC that it, on the surface doesn't appear you could do because of where the logic lives? Well, I want to get from having pets to having cattle. Uh, pets, that's actually my next tangent. But right now I've got pets. Yeah. So how do I get a DSC to make my pet into cattle? Hold that thought. Yeah. I want to get the uh, output of one resource as input to another resource. You want to get the output of one resource as input to another resource. Yeah. Yeah. I want my pool to not have algae. But yeah, that I think is a more fundamental design issue. Um, we, oh, hang on. I don't want you to wear your arm out. We'll get there. We've talked about that because that's a really serious need. Um, it would be best for, for the product to address that, but since it doesn't, we decided to hack around with it. Um, how comfortable are you modifying every resource you use? Sure, good, brave man, I like you. Uh, we're gonna drink tonight. <laughs> it won't go well. <laughs> um, our idea was to take the same basic hash table that, that is in the configuration script that essentially goes into the moth that becomes the input to both your test and your set and your get, right? Uh, and persist that yeah. in just a known location that every resource can then choose to read in. Uh, we've even, talk to me and you might be able to talk me into getting access to our private Slack channel because we've even started hacking around with some tools to kind of abstract that, right? So you can just include this module and then have a persist function and uh, whatever the opposite verb is function uh, to, to 
add to your resources so you can do that. Um, one of the reasons we felt that would be better than a memory-based solution is because it, it, it almost acts a little bit more like workflow in that if something happens midway through and there's a reboot or whatever, right, the whole idea behind DSC is it should be able to just pick right back up again. Well, that, that would give you some state information about where you were because the LCM will know, but you won't. Yeah. Yeah, we've been hacking that around. But you... you yeah, so uh, the package resource in binary is like uh, a <laughs> antivirus, right? It's a gig in size. Every time a consistency check runs, whether I need the version installed or not, it's going to download that thing again. Yeah. Long enough to look at it and say, oh, no, I've got this locally. Forget it. it makes yeah, so, so, so short version of question. Package manager sucks because it has to go get the file in order for it to determine if that's open. And when the file is huge, it just takes a long time and hold things up. And I think it really, we can boil that down to the current package resource sucks. Um, and that is really not the, the fault of the people who wrote the package resource. It's the fault of the people who wrote Windows installer and, and install shield and all this other garbage. So Windows itself just does not have a great way of doing that. I think the go forward solution there, and we're, we're just like on the, the precipice of this starting to become a thing, is PowerShell Package Manager, which if you're using the right repository that supports checksums and everything else, would let us author a new package resource that could check things that way. It would be nice if Package Manager could look at the product ID, say it's installed. Well, lots, lots of things would be nice, but it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> we can write our own. I don't, think writing, I don't think writing a better package manager is at all outside the scope of what DSC does. And, and let's take that as a philosophical point. I'm not actually picking on you. Well, a little bit. Um, but not really. If you're looking at one of the, the Microsoft-provided resources for DSC, other than the file one, which is binary, right? So if you're looking at those and you're like, yeah, this kind of sucks. It'd be nice if it did this instead. You need to get your butt on GitHub, fork the project, and fix it instead of complaining, right? Because there's certain bits of the product that only Microsoft can do, right? Like we can't fix the LCM. We can't fix the pull server code. We don't have access to that. The things we can't fix are the things they need to focus on. And the rest of the stuff we need to do for ourselves. And that's just how it is. It'd be nice if they gave us everything, but then they could do our jobs and we wouldn't need our jobs. So. That's where we are right now. So the package, there's actually a lot of people who are hacking away to make better versions of that. Um, get involved in one of those projects. The current one relies too much on the Windows installer database and anything not hooked up to Windows installer sucks. And then the Windows installer validation process sucks. Anybody ever query Win32 product on a server 2003 machine and then lose your job? <laughs> Why is the server slow for six hours a day? I don't know. It was a virus. I don't know. I'll run a scam. It's my login script story. Um, so, any, any, any more? Any things that, that I'd love it if DSC could do this, but it just doesn't seem possible the way it's architected? Because that's where we're here. We're going to hack the architecture. Okay, so you're completely satisfied with everything DSC does, and you feel the architecture is completely approachable and finished. That's fantastic. We'll pass that on to the team. They'll appreciate that. Ordering, ordering like composites, you can't do it depends on, right? Ordering and composites, right. You can't do it depends on. Um, I would argue that you probably don't want it to, because the amount of logic that would go into tearing those apart and going down that rabbit hole would make the thing impossible. Um, I'll, I'll make a design argument, which is, so do you guys know the whole reason that, you guys know what depends on is, right? You need to jiggle your heads. Okay. The whole argument in favor of doing depends on is in case the LCM ever becomes multi-threaded. If the LCM is doing 10 things at once, it needs to know which one's not to do yet. And that's what depends on is designed to document. Um, my argument, because it, that becomes a problem for composites. I have an argument against depends on, which is that it makes your configuration document harder to read. Unless you actually list everything voluntarily in, in depends on order, it becomes hard for a human being to parse that. All right, so that's going to happen, and that's going to happen, and that's going to happen, and oh, oh no, that's going to happen, then that's going to happen, because this has to, it gets harder just to mentally grasp it. It's a make file. Kind of like a make file. 
my argument, and this is a design thing, and this is something Microsoft would have to address. My argument is that a not doing depends on, and instead doing a sequential, which is like what Chef and Puppet and those guys do, and occasionally giving us a keyword called coalesce. Meaning, here's 10 things, do them first in whatever order you want to, and then stop until all of those things are done, and then continue with phase two. That would have been semantically, I think, a lot easier to read, a lot easier to implement, and avoided that whole problem. Because then sequence becomes important. So, we can talk about that with them tomorrow. Because they'll be here. Yes, we can suggest that. Jump up and down on screen. Anything else architectural? I want to do dynamically generate config, yeah, who is that, right? Locally, yeah. Yeah, um, I'll give you two, two places I think we could do, and I think we can do this almost nearly today-ish, in terms of dynamically generated configurations. I think we can do locally dynamically generated configurations on the node today. You're gonna to have to write your own resource to do that, but that's what we're talking about here. I think we are nearly to the point where we could also dynamically generate them on the pull server. Now that pull server protocol is documented. We just don't have any code to look at so that we can make our own smarter pull server. I think we will get that. I mean, they've been pretty clear that their goal is to open source at least sample code where you could build your own. And at that point, we could have our own pull server taking state data from right then and dynamically generating them off to hand to the node. I think we're close to that. We can do everything now except the actual pull server because we don't know what the code looks like and none of us wants to just reverse engineer the protocol. I think we're nearly there. Let's talk about cattles and pets. The, uh, the cattle versus pet thing is something that's going to require 10% operating system design change and I don't think these are major. I think it's just a very evolutionary step and 90% us changing our processes. How many of you, for example, assign static IP addresses to your servers? Why? Do you not have DHCP? Do you not know about DHCP? <laughs> are, you, are you afraid of DHCP? Or are you superstitious about DHCP? How many of you just think DHCP is freaking voodoo? Vendor requirement. Who thinks it's science? Yeah, so let's take that for a second. Vendor requirement is bullshit. That is, that is the 90% us changing our processes, right? You can't say, I wish I could do X, but there are stupid people in the world. I know that. We're all surrounded by them on the highway every single day. But that's not a reason to, you can't say, I need to re-engineer the entire universe because of stupid people. No, that's an HR problem. You need to bury the stupid people in the desert. That's why I live in Vegas. <laughs> if you've got stupid people, you can't have nice things, period. So we're not talking about the situation where you just politically can't have nice things because you've got the option to go find a different job. So let's talk about the technology things, right? There is no reason to not have your servers getting their IP addresses from a DHCP server or, or a DHCP-like entity, right? You get on a SCVMM, for example, and you've got IP address pools and things that, that aren't DHCP, but they're vaguely similar, right? There's no reason that a configuration, a DSC configuration MOF, needs to be pushing a static IP address, they should be set for DHCP. And if you want to, as your kind of meta configuration, be configuring reservations and stuff like that, God be with you, that's fine. But cattle don't have names, and an IP address is a name. And so you should not be assigning names, you should be doing that at a meta level. That's problem number one. Problem number two, machine name, right? That's the other unique piece of information we have to set. Well, ish. Windows anymore makes up a name for itself when you first install it. Let it keep it. Who cares what the cow thinks its name is? I don't care. As part of the configuration, rather than assigning a name, because your configuration is often going to be role-based, right? Your configuration is telling the machine to be a certain way. Part of who it should be is registering the necessary C name records in DNS. That's what you talk to it by, right? If you're, if you're in this application, well then register that name and that's what we're all gonna call you. The only couple of, and, and, and this is where we get to the 10% that has to be an OS design change, the only couple of weirdnesses you get there is, let's say PowerShell remoting becomes involved. Can I easily remote to a machine via a C name? Yeah. Eh, not as easily as knowing its name. 
because I need to know it's canonical Active Directory name if it's in Active Directory so I can get a Kerberos ticket for it. It won't work with a C name. But you can certainly work around that, right? If, for example, you were doing the right thing and that machine was requesting a certificate for itself with its C name, then that certificate could be used on an HTTPS listener, which is what you should be doing anyway because none of us are dumb enough to be doing remoting over HTTP, right? <laughs> Home Depot guys, Target, it's gonna happen. So if the machine knows its role, then it knows what C name to set up for itself. And yeah, are you gonna have to then come up with a backend process to periodically scour or scavenge those? Possibly, you could certainly have things like expirations on them because the LCM is going to run periodically and make sure that it's re-registered. So you just look to see the last time it was just every hour, right? The LCM doesn't have to run every 15 minutes. You know that, right? It can do it less frequently. Every hour, go, go update the update record on your, your C name so that I know it's recent. And if, if anything becomes too old, I'll have another process that scavenges those. Pretty much exactly like DHCP works. So you got your C name record there. That means you can go to our PKI. How many of you have PKI? Rest of you need to catch up. We all need PKI. Go to the PKI and get a certificate in that name. And now you can hook that up to an HTTPS remoting listener. And so now I can remote easily into the machine using its C name. I never need to know its natural machine name. You think Microsoft knows the machine names of all the, the crap they have running in Azure? I doubt it. They sure as heck don't have an Excel spreadsheet somewhere tracking all that garbage. Which is what you use, I don't know. <laughs> How many of you use Excel to track your static IP addresses or servers? Yeah, of course you do. It's the only brave one that admits it, the rest of your line. I know. So when you start thinking about the things that are unique, most of them are only unique because of the way we're accustomed to doing things. Not because there's a tremendous technological hurdle. Is, is it inconvenient to change? Well, no, it's only inconvenient if you're holding on to your old processes. If you just let go, then it's actually not hard at all. Static IP addresses for servers, I mean, move on. Let it go. Let it go. I'm not saying, don't worry. <laughs> we only do that in the closing session, and it's a, it's a song about beer. What else? Who else is, is, is moving toward a servers are cattle, not pets kind of environment? And, and are you using DSC to help with that in some ways? Yeah? Good. DSC and Chef. Yeah. Yeah. And it works. You're standing, so I'm assuming that there hasn't been a bloodbath. Not yet. Not yet. It's possible. You just have to decide that you're going to change your processes. And, and you know what? If there's a theme to this whole discussion, it's, it's forget what you know and think about fresh, right? That's what this, this whole thing is. Forget what DSC's architecture is, as you've been told. What could you do with it if you just stepped outside of the lines a little bit? Forget about, well, you know, you've got to have a machine name. Do you? Really? Right? So just step outside those lines a bit. What are some other architectural things that you wish DSC did that, that you just don't think it can do? Oh, that's right. Everyone's completely happy with the product and doesn't want any changes to it. I forgot. What if it was able to, uh, one resource being able to call more than another ah. for itself? Ah, that is actually really good. That Dave, Dave Wyatt and I have been arguing about this, and I'm afraid he's right, the bastard. Because I wanted to make, so the question was, what about one DSC resource calling another DSC resource? And you might think, well, why would you do that? Well, here's a really good example. Let's say I wanted to write an, an, a dynamic evaluation resource. Okay, So in my configuration script, it would say, uh, pick, pick a basic resource that you like. Oh, but that's good. File. File. <laughs> so let's say we only want a copy of this file if this thing in WMI is set to this value, right? Something like that. So my idea was, we'll write a resource and it's query this WMI class, compare it to this value, and if it's true, run the file resource with tab to indent these settings. If it's not true, 
tab to indent, run the file sort resource with these settings instead, right? And so we're, we kind of went down this and I said, so look, and, and there's two answers. Answer one, if you are using function-based resources, you can totally do this because they're just modules. So your, your if-then resource, if we can call it that, can we call it that, if-then? Your if-then resource can just go load the module into its scope and call the test and the set. It can just manually pretend that it's the LCM and run those things. Uh, it's a little harder with class-based resources because if a class-based resource attempts to instantiate another one, you actually get an error saying that there's a configuration of a consistency check already in progress. Like the LCM gets involved and, and stomps on you. So we haven't figured out a workaround for that yet. Um, but for function-based ones, you can have one resource call another. Class ones, I still think there has to be a way to step out of the scope and get into it, but we haven't, we haven't gotten it to do what we want quite yet. Yeah, what that change the INI file and restart the service situation? Sure, change the INI file and restart the service. We still have INI files? That's awesome. Yeah. I love INI files. What else? Anybody tried to do anything crazy with DSC? Or are you just doing like file package network firewall? Yeah, just the basics. Nah, I got home and got crazy with it. Go nuts with it. Try weird stuff. Set yourself up a little lab. What do you need? Like three machines? Client server, pull server. Do crazy stuff. Because crazy stuff is how we break it. And crazy stuff is how we push the edges. And until we try to break it, nobody can fix it. So we have to try and break it first. And let's find out where it's not doing what we think it needs to do so that we can tell the team, because that's really what they want to hear, right? They're just, they know they're just guessing as to what we need based on conversations they've had, but they need more conversations. And we got to try and break stuff. We got to try and push the edges of it and find out, you know what, this model would work really well, except this one thing it won't let me do. Can you take that off? Make a case for it. Reporting is tooling. Yeah, go ahead. One thing I'd like to see is something you could point DSC at an existing machine oh, yeah. and say generate, you know, configuration value based on how this machine is set up. Sure, point point DSC at a machine and have it just generate a config for how that machine is set up. Um, two two responses. Response number one, that's tooling. Right? That's not so we gotta we gotta make sure we're differentiating between platform and tooling. DSC is not tooling, DSC is platform. So what you're after is a tool, because that's not something you're gonna do, you know, every five minutes. You're gonna do it as a provisioning thing. We'd also like tools to do reporting, for God's sake. That'd be nice. Um, we'd like tools to be able to keep track of what config was supposed to go to what machine. That'd be great. All that will be called system center, expensive, something, 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 I'm sure, one day. <laughs> so so let's, we'll diverge to tooling for just a second. I don't think you do want that. I think people think they want that, and I hear that a lot. But let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit, because when you point that thing at that machine, is it just going to enumerate every single registry key, file, service, process, ever? Or is it supposed to compare like a base OS with, it gets really tough. And Windows has got 632 quadzillion management points and it doesn't know which one you care about. Now what I would say is that it's probably legit to ask for a tool like the packaging tools used to do where it can watch. Yes. Right? Okay, I've got everything up, here's my base image, begin watching. Um, yeah, but except people make that, right? That's what, um, 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 oh heck, they used to be a sponsor of us. <laughs> Dev, power, uh, people with stuff. <laughs> Script Rock. Uh, Upguard. Up Upguard. Up oh, they did change their name. No one knows why. Yeah, so there's, there's people who do that. You're gonna have to pay for it, but you know, if you want nice things, you have to pay for them. Um, I'm not sure I would ever expect Microsoft to produce that tool. Just because they've declined to do so in so many different iterations, the exception being AppV, right? Which is part of how AppV, that's how you AppVify an app as they watch it while you install it. Um, but they bought that from someone else, so it's hard to tell. But yeah, uh, those tools exist. Now what they don't currently do, what, what UpGuard does not do, is make a moth out of that, but I think that's just a matter of enough customers saying, you know what we'd really like. How about installing MSU files? Installing MSU files. MSU, you mean patches? Uh, I don't know, I go back and forth on that one. 
I am. Um, I don't view DSC as a patch deployment mechanism. But, but what if you need a specific patch? Oh, you just need one, like on a short-term thing. Or, or just because the, you know that system for your business case yeah. needs this patch in place. Yeah. Um, and you want to make sure that it's on there, but not maybe necessarily run the entire Windows update. I'm. I'm not sure. I, I go back and forth. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm. I'm just going to apply it. Because <laughs> they, they release PowerShell five as a MSU file. And and part of me says that that DSC can't be the one tool you use to maintain your entire infrastructure, and that the best use of DSC for a software deployment situation would be to use DSC to make sure that your software deployment solution is installed and active and running, and then use your software deployment solution to push files and crap. And, and the reason I say that is because software deployment is such a is such a thing. You have to track status because you want to be able to query it. You have to have distribution points. You have to worry about WAN links when you're pulling software. And I, I just think that starts to get outside of basic config. I think your basic config is make sure that this other solution is configured so that it will do its job. Um, that's kind of where I sit. I, I, we're in this weird space with software deployment right now. Um, my suspicion is that as Microsoft moves more and more toward a cloud command and control Intune style stuff with maybe on-prem distribution points, you'll start to see that becoming easier. I, I think right now, it's great to say, just use DSC to configure your patch management software deployment solution, except we really don't have a great one. You know, we've got Windows Update and Sikkim, and that's it. Um, can we call it Sikkim anymore? Uh, so. Yeah, I, that's kind of one of the reasons I'm not really looking for the package resource to be all that awesome. To a point, like, you know, to the, to the young RPM level, sure, uh, but I don't really want to see DSC become a whole software deployment solution because we already have so many of them and they really suck. Um, so I'd rather get one of the ones we have working. But that's something fun to talk about. Let's, let's drink and talk about that because it's more interesting. Yeah. Even the, the squishy metaphor, like where you know, users and desktops That's not a metaphor. People are squishy. Oh, okay. All right. Just try it. Poke So, uh, so application deployment there, I can see where you're, that argument there. But for the servers where it's maybe there's just the one application they want, and really the push out the latest version of. No, no, no. I, I think you and I are on the same same page there. I, I, I think as you get into a server, and your goal is to provision a server and you need this management agent and you need this and this and this, you need to get it to the point where it can participate in the rest of the infrastructure. I think that's a legitimate use for DSC being able to deploy packages. Um, contingent on, A, us getting something that really works well, like PowerShell Package Manager hopefully will for us, right? We need a, a young RPM you know, package manager, not just giant file full of Windows installer files. Um, and it'd be really nice if we could just burn Windows installer to the ground and never look at it again. That'd be great. Because it, it's the source of most problems, because people build crappy packages. Not that Windows installer is bad, it's what people do with it, right? Guns don't kill people, developers kill people. So it's, it's basically that. Um, so I, I, I think there is definitely, you know, this, this almost gets into the, the DevOps-ish world, right? Do we have, no, we don't have time. Well, sometime when we're drinking, Get me to tell you my whole DevOps story, and, and that kind of fits it in well. One more question, all the way in the back. Here's first. Uh, uh, managing network objects instead of just machines. And doing who? Uh, network. Networking. Networking. Love it. Switch. Oh, you mean you like using DSC to manage switches and stuff? Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty much your job to pressure your network vendor because Microsoft has already done all the work they need to do in that space. They've created a, a, a reference OMI stack, right? OMI is basically a super lightweight WS MAN stack and a super lightweight SIM repository that doesn't require a repository. It's all in memory. So it's designed to run small footprint, small processor. It's designed to run in embedded devices like switches. And there's at least one company, Dell, uh, that's already jumping on this bandwagon, and you can you can shove them off into one of their switches, and it'll it'll do it. So th that's happening. You just got to make your vendors jump on board. Who's your vendor, Cisco? Yep. Have fun. Good luck with that.
Well, Cisco and some of their stuff is, yeah. Yeah, and, and they'll roll it across generations. The fact is that Microsoft with DSC did the most intelligent thing I've, I've seen the company do in a long time, and they didn't invent a lot of new crap. They just adopted standards that were already out there. And so for other companies to jump on doesn't mean they have to bow down to Redmond. They're just doing what the rest of the industry had already decided, but not actually implemented. Microsoft was the first to put a big implementation out there and got the ball rolling. So it, that's already happening. So look, cool, guys, uh, we're at the end. Thanks very much, and uh, you know, enjoy the dinner on tonight. Thank you. And uh, let's, you know, let's keep talking and, and having ideas. Yeah. Oh, button. And now that you're not being recorded, you've mentioned so many times, where are we drinking now?